In the middle of the First World War, John Ronald Rule Tolkien, a soldier for the Allies, imagines two knights fighting one another. He's anxious as he holds a letter in his hands. He has a difficult decision to make. Grabbing his gun and putting away his stack of letters and journal, he leaves his barracks. As his subordinate asks him where he is going to, he answers that he's going to help his friends in the front lines, and that if he's not back, he knows what to do. The war is raging, sounds of explosions and gunfire are the background for his mission. He's sick. The doctor gave him orders to rest because his fever can get worse. There's a big explosion and it almost hits him and his subordinate. They have to take a break, John is really sick and shivering. His subordinate tells him he needs to keep warm because it's a long way to the front. As he tries to keep warm, he remembers his childhood in England. He and his friends are pretending to fight each other with wooden sticks, as if they were swords. The objective of the game is to try to get the banner from the opposite team by fighting your way through. John grabs the banner and runs while his team cheers. He's very fast and manages to hide behind a stone wall before they find him. Some time later, he goes back home. There's a priest there, Father Francis, who scolds him and says that he prayed to have a strong son who would help in the workload, yet John was playing with his friends. His mother Mabel and brother Hilary come down the stairs and tell him to pack because they are going to Birmingham. John asks why, and his mother is emotional when she tells him that Father Francis has found them rooms and that he's very generous. John doesn't want to go to Birmingham. Patiently, Mabel explains that they are going to face difficult times and that they are fortunate to have the church supporting them. His father passed away in South Africa, John's birthplace. John runs away from the house, tearing up, and his mother goes after him. They hug, and Mabel tells him a sentence in Latin that means wherever you feel happy that's your home. She tells him that they will find their place, and to lock the words in his heart so they can be there forever. John isn't happy as they leave. Birmingham is a grey industrial city, different from his countryside home, and there's a lot of pollution in the air. As they get to their new home, their mother asks the brothers if they know what impecunious circumstances are. John asks if it's the circumstances they are in at the moment, and Mabel answers that when she was a little girl. All the novels began with a family of good and brave people who find themselves in impecunious circumstances. John asks how they escaped, and his mother answers that by coming across some marvelous treasure, or marrying well. Hilary says he isn't marrying anyone, so Mabel tells him he will need the treasure then. John doesn't seem convinced that it's so easy to find a treasure in real life. His mother finds it funny and tells him that there's no way to fool him, but that there's treasure in treasure. John doesn't understand what she means, he and his brother are too young for that. Later, during bedtime, John is staring out the window at his new town. Mabel appears to tell him and his brother a bedtime fantasy story, with dragons. While she tells the story, she also acts, and John lets his imagination fly. In the following scene, he's speaking a language that he created to his brother, but Hilary thinks it's ridiculous. He proceeds to speak in Latin to which his brother replies that he sounds like a drunk peacock. They arrive at home, and their mother is sitting on a chair. Hilary leaves the room, but John notices his mother almost falling from the chair. When he checks on her, he discovers a terrible truth. His mother is dead. He hugs her and cries. Back to adult John, he closes his eyes as he remembers his mother's death. He's obstinate, and tells his subordinate he needs to keep going. As he's crawling in the mud across the trenches, a gas bomb reaches him and his subordinate. He has to pull a piece of cloth on his mouth and nose to prevent from inhaling it. Once more, he begins to remember his childhood. John and Hilary are in a big house waiting for Father Francis and Mrs. Faulkner. Hilary is touching objects, but John is silent and contemplative. Father Francis tries to scare them by saying that Mrs. Faulkner is an enormous beast, and that she's chewing the bone of a small boy. Then, he jokes that there's also cake. Next, they're eating cake while Father Francis and Mrs. Faulkner talk. Father Francis tells her that they are good boys and very diligent, that their mother homeschooled them and they are fluent in many languages. Mrs. Faulkner wants to put them at King Edward's school because it will be good for them socially, because there are sons of respectful families studying there. She tells them it will be different from Africa, and John sarcastically answers that it's true as they hardly ever carry their spears anymore. Father Francis seems uncomfortable, but tries to smile. Mrs. Faulkner asks if they have been difficult to be placed at a foster home, and Father Francis answers that they have been with two other families, but that what they truly needed was a stable and refined environment. Mrs. Faulkner tells Father Francis that she gets attached easily to her lodgers, and that there's a girl, Edith, that is like her child. John is interested when he hears that. He and his brother are given a room with two beds. At night, the house makes sounds that keep John awake. He starts to imagine shadows moving on his wall, and gets up to draw them in his journal. In the following scene, John and Hilary walk to school. It's a big and old building, only for boys. Later, he's in the school's choir, but he isn't singing. In the classroom, the teacher makes him introduce himself and mispronounces his name. John stands and corrects the teacher, and some students find it funny. The teacher is embarrassed but asks them to open Chaucer's book in Middle English so they can practice pronunciation. 
He asks one of the students to read, but his pronunciation is terrible. Another boy who doesn't have the book takes John's book from him. Then the teacher asks him to read and his pronunciation is perfect. It's time for John to read, and some students are laughing at him because he doesn't have the book. Instead of failing, John recites the verses perfectly by memory. Everyone is shocked. Later on, when they are playing rugby, one of the students, Robert, tackles John and they fight. Because of the altercation they are sent to the headmaster's office. The headmaster lectures them, but John defends by saying they were only playing rugby, maybe more forcefully than necessary. The headmaster tells them that men are supposed to be comrades, and that as punishment they would do everything together for the rest of the term. As they leave the headmaster's office, Robert tells John that the move was to humiliate him, and that he's the headmaster's son. John is surprised. Back at home, he draws. The other day, as he and Hillary make their beds, he hears a soft piano sound coming from downstairs that makes him curious. He sees a girl playing for Mrs. Faulkner. It's Edith. He eavesdrops and enjoys the song. In the next scene, he's back at school in the library, and watches Robert and other boys mess around. Robert comes to him and asks John to come have tea with him and his friends. John denies. Another boy, Jeffrey, comes to him and tells John that Robert meant to apologize and take responsibility for their punishment, and that he wanted to make amends by inviting John to tea. Jeffrey explains that Robert's father is very strict with him and that he was jealous of John's cleverness in class. They introduce themselves, and John finally accepts to have tea with them. John and Robert even shake hands, and another friend, Christopher, is introduced. They go to Barrow's store where there's the best tea in town. John observes the place, but is very quiet. Jeffrey tries to include him while Robert and Christopher talk. Christopher is complaining that his father loves music, but refuses to let him work as a composer. Jeffrey agrees, his mother loves poetry, yet she doesn't want him to pursue it as a career. She's rather he be a lawyer or an accountant. Robert wants to paint, but if he mentioned it to his parents, he would probably be disowned. John chuckles at Robert's drama. At Mrs. Faulkner's house, they are having dinner and John can't stop staring at Edith. She notices and stares at him too. Later, they have jammed together and talk about their lives and wishes. Edith wants to leave the house and be free. She doesn't want to carry Mrs. Faulkner's purse or play the piano. She wants to be appreciated and to feel welcome. John shares her feelings, and they smile at each other. At night, he grabs a jar and puts some coins in it. Back to adult John, he and his subordinate are tired and dirty. John tells him that he's looking for his friend Lieutenant Jeffrey Smith, and that his mother wrote to him that she hasn't heard from Jeffrey in weeks. He isn't answering John's letters either. He's worried that his friend died, it's why he needs to go after him. His subordinate, Hodge, insists on going with him because John is terrible, and would probably not get there alone. Hodge goes in search of some medicine for John, and again he goes back to his memories. He and his friends are back at Barrows again, and Robert is delivering a loud speech about the lack of women in the legends John likes to read. Some patrons at the tea shop are mad about his loud voice, but he keeps going. Christopher and Jeffrey are playing a game. John tells Robert he's reading a book about a huge and ruthless goddess called Hell, who presides in the realm of the dead. Robert finds the story interesting, and decides he wants to have a fulfilling life. He asks his friends to challenge him, and Christopher suggests he proposes to the waitress. He does, and while Jeffrey is embarrassed, John is having fun. After they leave the Barrows, John suggests they should form a club, a brotherhood. They each give a name, but all names sound ridiculous, until they decide on the Tea Club and the Barovian Society, TCBS for short. The objective is to change the world through art, and to pledge loyalty to each other. John draws many pictures of fantastic beings, places, and he starts writing. Years go by, and the TCBS are all grown. John reads his stories to them, and he and Edith go out in secret whenever they can. They like going to fancy places. One of the places they go to is a fancy restaurant, and all the women are wearing hats but Edith. When she mentions it to John, he says they all look ridiculous anyway. Then, he speaks a language he invented to her, and she is in awe. He likes inventing languages, and his next one will have music to it. They have a discussion about language and structure, and Edith tells him that a word is the marriage of sound and meaning. They have a moment where Edith softly touches John's hand to explain what she meant. Then, she asks him to tell her a story, though John doesn't want to. She insists, and when he still disagrees, she begins the story herself. The story is about a princess called Cellardor, but John thinks the name doesn't belong to a person, but to a place. He starts telling his own story, making it up as he goes, and imagining what he's describing. As he tells the story, Edith is absorbed by it. They have another moment staring at each other's eyes but they become awkward very quickly. To disperse the tension, Edith throws a sugar cub in one of the women's hats, and proposes John does the same. In the end, they are expelled from the fancy restaurant. They both think it's funny. In the following scene, they are in a park. John lies down on the leaf-covered floor watching Edith dance while the sun shines all around her, creating a beautiful vision. Later, once again they go out together in secret, but this time someone notices. They go to Barrows where Edith is going to meet John's friends for the first time. It's awkward and they are quiet for a moment, until Edith starts a conversation. They talk about college. John and Jeffrey are going to Oxford, while Christopher, 
and Robert are going to Cambridge. Edith shares a love for music with Christopher, and they start a discussion about operas, and Edith is really interested by Christopher's opinions. John is jealous, so he interrupts the conversation and says they have to go home. Nobody understands why exactly they left so early. On their way home, Edith questions if John is ashamed of her, and he's confused about how she got to this idea. She's upset that he didn't let her discuss what she's passionate about with his friend. John stays quiet as she spills her sorrows away. Then, she turns and leaves. He doesn't go after her. Back in the trenches, John stares at the desolate land and imagines a huge dragon spitting fire. Instead of being a dragon, it's the enemy's flamethrower. They are being attacked. John runs with other soldiers, trying to escape the fire until he and Hodge get to a field full of corpses and a pond of blood and mud. In the following scene, Edith is playing the piano to Mrs. Faulkner, John and Hillary. She plays a summer song that matches her mood, and Mrs. Faulkner asks her to play something more cheerful. Edith is tired of doing what she asks all the time. Taking a deep breath, she changes the tune. John finally understands why she was so upset when he didn't let her discuss her favorite composer with Christopher. Later on, Jeffrey is reading one of his poems to his friends. They give him good opinions, but he's not convinced. John didn't bring anything to read on his turn, which is surprising. Robert decides to show them something he's working on. They are pictures of semi women. He wants to have life models. As they talk and have fun, Christopher mentions he's interested in Edith after John says they just share a lodge. It's weird that he's not presented anything during one of their meetings, and his friends think it's because of love, requited or not. Christopher provokes John, saying that he kept Edith a secret from them, and he's wondering what else he's keeping a secret. John answers back. Before things escalate between them, they hear footsteps. It's Robert's father. The headmaster isn't happy that the boys are in his house, so he demands Robert send them away. Instead of obeying, though, his friends suggest he defies his father, and he does. Fortunately, everything ends well and they celebrate. In the next scene, John decides to apologize to Edith by giving her an invitation to an opera called The Ring Cycle. They go together, and she explains to him the plot. It's about a magical ring forged by a dwarf that can rule the world. But to harness the ring's power, it's necessary to renounce love. Unfortunately, there are no places left in the opera, and John has no money to pay for the more expensive ones. They leave, still John tries to enter by the employee's entrance, but it's locked. He's embarrassed and humiliated that he doesn't have money to take care of Edith. She doesn't seem to mind though, and when the opera begins, Edith decides to dance with the clothes stored in the employee's area. They act as if they are in the opera and have a lot of fun. In the end, they kiss. Next day, John is late for his Oxford's entrance exam. John doesn't pass, and he needs a scholarship to enter. Father Francis tells him that and that his relationship with his friends and Edith is getting in his way of his future. John denies it, but Father Francis knew that the night before he had gone to the opera with Edith. He demands that John breaks up with Edith, but John tells him he's in love with her. Still, Father Francis is relentless and tells John that if he loves Edith at the age of 21, he can do as he pleases. John is upset, but obstinate. He decides he can't fail the exam again, because if he does, he will end up being a priest. He tells Edith that they can't be together, but he won't give up on her. She doesn't believe him and leaves. Back in the trenches, John orders Hodge to find Jeffrey for him, because he can't. He asks him to tell Jeffrey to not lose hope. In the following scene, the boys are all in Oxford with some girls they met. John and Jeffrey had both passed the exam. They are having fun, but the girl John is with notices that he doesn't seem very open with her. Christopher tells her that he's pining for Edith, even after months. Christopher and John get into an argument that turns into a physical fight. The anger doesn't last long, though, and soon they are in good moods again. Unfortunately, they get arrested for entering an omnibus without permission. Jeffrey waits for John to be let out of the jail, and they both have to talk to the rector of Oxford because of that. In his dormitory, John stares at a letter he wrote to Edith. Later, when he's with his friends, he tells them that Oxford won't endorse his scholarship because he doesn't have the grades to pass. The only solution for him is to get a job. His friends don't think it's fair since he's the most talented out of the four of them. Still, there's nothing they can do. On the next day, they play rugby while Jeffrey's mother watches. At the end of the game, John asks to talk to her and tells her that the problem with the rector and the arrest was his fault. He informs her that he's going to be sent down and she doesn't need to worry about his bad influence on Jeffrey anymore. He also tells her that Jeffrey has talents as a poet, and she should give him a chance. She only wishes good afternoon to him and walks away. Later on, John gets a letter that disturbs him greatly. He drinks a lot, and starts to talk loudly in the language he created in the middle of the campus. Professors wake up and yell at him to get off the lawn. He doesn't, instead he lies down to watch the stars and they remind him of his beloved Edith. Once again he imagines a dark knight riding a horse in a desolate field. The knight has a black mask covering his features. Meanwhile, Jeffrey comes to his rescue. He tries to make John get up, but ends up on the floor with him. John asks him if he would like to come to a summer wedding. And when Jeffrey is confused, he shares that Edith is getting married. He starts crying, everything around him is falling apart. Jeffrey comforts him. In the next scene, John and Jeffrey are watching a fencing class. When asked if he was okay, John answers that he's delighted. 
Jeffrey advises him to see the beauty in an unrequited love, and that he can seek comfort in poems. John thanks him, but they are interrupted by a man speaking ancient Gothic. The man is Professor Wright. Jeffrey leaves, so he sits down beside John and asks him if he's enjoying the book he's reading about the Gothic language. John answers that he is, though there's little about the actual language there. Then, Wright asks about the language he was speaking the night before, when he was drunk. He didn't recognize it. John replies that it's only a language he invented to the fairies. They talk some more, but when John introduces himself, Wright abruptly stands up and leaves. Seeing this as an opportunity, he goes after him. They talk about languages and how they are constructed, and John is in awe of his knowledge. The way he talks about languages reminds John of Edith. They share the same opinion that a word without meaning is just a sound. Wright suggests that John goes to the library to grab some Gothic originals to study. As Wright walks away again, John has an epiphany. The writer of the book he was reading about Gothic is Professor Wright. He's shocked at this discovery. He meets with his friends again and complains about what he said to Professor Wright, the critic he made of the book. His friends comfort him, but he's embarrassed. Robert suggests that he takes Wright's class then, since it's obvious the professor is encouraging him. The problem is, John's course isn't philology. Still, his friends motivate him to try to change the course so he can get a scholarship in something he's really good at. He decides to take a shot and goes after Professor Wright again. Professor Wright doesn't seem convinced about John, and proceeds to complain about him in Middle English, which John understands perfectly. It impresses Wright. He gives him an assignment of writing 5,000 words on the influence of Norse elements in Gawain for that evening, and John readily accepts. He writes the paper, and it works. He enters Wright's class of philology. The first work they read is Beowulf. He's happy he's finally studying something he's passionate about. During his studies, he writes more stories, and reads them to Professor Wright, who is impressed by him. He tells John he's never seen anyone write the way he does. Unfortunately, in the middle of one of his readings, another student comes yelling that England entered the war. It's disheartening, but the professor doesn't let John fret. He keeps reading his story, while the students all celebrate they are going to war. In the following scene, John sends the letter he had written to Edith months before. Then, he enlists and becomes a soldier. At a party with other soldiers, he offers Christopher a drink. They share a saddened look. Robert and Jeffrey also arrive, and they make a toast over their friendship. When they leave, it's a surprise to see Edith waiting for John. They talk and share the news about their lives. Edith is a piano teacher, and is engaged. John interrupts her to confess his regret about choosing Oxford over her, and tells her she's the most remarkable spirit he's ever met. She doesn't say anything back, and they leave to go to the ship for the soldiers. They say their goodbyes, and John leaves. They are both uncertain of leaving, and in the end, they run towards each other and share a kiss full of love and longing. They confess their love, and Edith demands that John come back to her. In the trenches, John is really sick. Hodge comes back and tells him he found Jeffrey's battalion. Unfortunately, Jeffrey had already gone to battle. But John goes after him on the battlefield, without any weapons. People are dying left and right, and he starts hallucinating, seeing and hearing Jeffrey everywhere, as well as shadows and the Dark Knight again. Still, he doesn't give up. He hears whispers as the Dark Knight kills the soldiers with his sword. Then, a huge shadow monster appears right in front of him. Next scene, John is in the infirmary, and Edith is there with him, happy that he's alive. She tells him he had trench fever, but now he was back home again. He replies that he tried to find Jeffrey, but couldn't. Edith shares that Jeffrey is dead. Robert is also dead. He cries for his friends and is comforted by Edith. Later, Father Francis visits John and talks to him, saying that Edith never left him and that he was right to pursue her. Then, he gives him a letter from Jeffrey. In the letter, he says that the death of one member cannot be the end of their club, and that he wishes John tells the world what he could never say. John gets emotional reading the letter. Years later, in Oxford, John became a professor of philology. He and Edith are married and have two sons. John isn't a present father. He's always working, and Edith is upset and complains to him. He apologizes and tells her nothing he writes is good for him. He thinks writing is pointless. She replies that he should decide what he wants to do. That night, he can't sleep. The next day, he goes back to Barrows to meet with Jeffrey's mother. They talk about his friends, and John mentions that Christopher isn't doing well. She thanks him for bringing her to the place where her son had a good time with friends. John asks her for permission to publish some of Jeffrey's poems, and at first she's not convinced. But John manages to convince her by saying that Jeffrey knew how to love and be loved, and that's why it's important to publish his poems. To show his art to the world in a time of war and losses. In the end, John is with his family in a forest. There, he tells the story he intends to write about journeys, love, adventure, magic, treasures and fellowship. The next scene, he's already writing. The first sentence of his book is, In a hole in the ground lived a hobbit. His first book was published in 1937 and he is now considered one of the most acclaimed fantasy writers in the world. 